Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. Second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, uh, I have my uh, my old friends, uh, uh, Jeffrey Orthwan and Andrew Sullivan here. They're going to talk about uh, the previews for their movie. We A couple weeks ago, we, we talked about it a little bit, and uh, we're going to talk about it some more today. They're going to show us more about how they get ready. They're shooting later this uh, month, so um, so it should be a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, tomorrow we have AI Media. They know kind of everything about captions. They they uh, just purchased uh, EEG, which is what the hardware that we use, and they make the software. So should be an interesting discussion. That's tomorrow. Uh, education, of course, from eight to ten on Saturday. We don't put that on YouTube. And then at ten o'clock we'll have part two of our um, building our tally lights uh, with uh, with Roger Wagner. Uh, the first one was a lot of fun. It's on YouTube if you want to take a look at it. But it's um, three hours of, of us <laughs> hacking together uh, a pizza box with electronics. A lot of fun. We're going to program it to, um, this week, and then uh, at noon we have. Uh, just remember that we have the Todd Reynolds experience. You can see you can find Todd Reynolds on YouTube, and that and you can watch the behind the scenes in our after hours, or you can watch the show on YouTube. So um, so stay tuned for that. And then uh, and that's at noon on Pacific Standard Time on uh, on Saturday, and then Sunday, of course, is our kind of our more philosophical look back at the week and answer questions. We're answering a couple of them today, but when generally the questions about. Why are we here? What are we doing in office hours or after hours? And where are we going? So we'll have a lot to talk about there on Sunday. And uh, now we'll go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, what do we have? Our first one comes from Andy Dalla in Berlin, and he says, Office Hours 2.0 has no, quote, classic gallery view anymore. From, from the viewer's point, I miss seeing all the panelists. From the technical director point, I'd like to cut more often to smart gallery to get this group feeling back, but the panelists uh, could pay more attention to the gallery view. Any thoughts on this? Right, go ahead, Chris. Uh, Andre, I completely agree. I think that um, there's a delicate balance and the, my best way of describing it as a director is claustrophobia. So if I'm too close, you know, single, 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 I start to feel like I'm intruding too much. Um, I very much like the wide shot. And in this particular show, the wide shot is the gallery view. And I, I've watched a few shows just, um, you know, that I wasn't participating in. And I absolutely felt like... Um, I was in too close. I was, it was a little too intimate. That being said, it's very interesting. I, I tweeted something just yesterday. It was a complaint about the, uh, the Apple keynote that, you know, here I am watching it virtually online and they keep cutting to these extremely wide shots of little tiny Tim Cook from the back of the theater. And I was like, you know, I'm online. Why do I have to sit in the back row to watch this? I'd rather be up close. So it's a, it's a total balance, Andre. And, but I agree. I'd like to see the gallery view more. And I'm looking Mitchell. over and I see a single. Mitchell? I, I agree with Andre and, uh, and Chris. I think it, uh, it, it needed to see that reaction. But the other thing to point out is that we're blazing a new trail. We can do whatever we want, whatever makes sense. And um, I think some things you can carry forward that are traditional ways of, of cutting. Uh, but at the same time, let's not be afraid to try things uh, that are brand new. Hey, Bill? I love the thought, and I agree with you. The thing is, for me, uh, I have just started three days ago pinning the show view, essentially the Office Hours 2.0 view, on my teleprompter monitor so that I can actually see the arrangement that the director, technical director, has put up. And that has been a little bit transformative to me. I've always had on my main computer screen the gallery view, and I found myself attracted to that, and I watch, I, I tilt down and watch that a lot. This is causing me to pay a little more attention to the camera because that's my idea of what's going out. And I, it has changed my behavior. When I'm in a two shot, I try not to you know, rub my face or things like that. And I was not thinking of that before because I was so focused on the gallery view. So it is just an interesting change in the process that a panelist or someone else goes through in making the show. I, we're learning, I'm learning. Yeah, some of it's, uh, I, I, I do think we need to show the gallery view more often. Um, there are some technical and logistical reasons that we don't oftentimes. So um, so the logistical reason, exactly what Bill mentioned, is that I actually asked them to do it less because I like to relax a little bit as, as the host. So I like to have, you know, have, a, have my, uh, my swig of tea or, or coffee, and I like to look down, and I like to do a bunch of other things. And when I'm on air, 
feel like I should be looking up. So, so I, I, I it, for me, I, it, while it may feel claustrophobic, it, it, it's, it's more relaxing show. And I'm used to that from Mac break, I admit, because I'm not, you know, I'm off air a lot, you know, and that gives me time to do all the other things that I want to do. So um, during the show, it's usually like researching things or looking at things and all those other bits and pieces. The other, the other time is that, especially in second hours, you know, a lot of the panelists decide to drop out. It, our current smart gallery, if you drop below nine, becomes really not workable. <laughs> so, so what happens is you never see the, it, you know, we have, you know, everyone's volunteers here and people are busy and things go up and down. Uh, if our panelists drop below nine people, uh, you won't see a smart gallery. <laughs> so, so, so because it doesn't frame well, you know, just, it does just, we just have empty gaps. So, so, um, so if the panelists are, uh, up, you'll see the smart gallery a lot more if the panelists are above nine, especially if it's above 16 or six at 16, if it's lower, um, you know, it usually means that we have a smaller crew the day, you know, and, uh, you know, every day we have the people that we need, <laughs> you know, so we get great answers for the, for the questions, but, but those are the, some of the things that we kind of, um, you know, those are some extra considerations that are less about creative and more about just how the system runs. And we have to figure, we're figuring those bits and pieces out. Go ahead, Mitchell. How about metahumans? Uh, we could put, no, put our meta. Uh, the <laughs> answer is no, no. <laughs> so, so like, no, yeah, no, no, no. There you have it, folks. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. working. We're making decisions right here, right yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, considering how bad my metahuman is, there's no way I would allow that. Uh, Douglas Carmichael, uh, I miss hearing the morning banter and sound checks before the show. Will there be some way for us to listen to behind the scenes in the future? Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Well, I can't answer about the timing, but uh, I love banter, as you can see. I like talking and I can talk and talk and talk until it makes absolutely no sense. So that's all I'm telling. Yeah, I, I think the banter goes still goes out in the webinar right now. Um, I do think that, so what's gonna happen is, is that um, as we get over to the new, like the new format, right now we're still pushing back into the webinar. Um, we will, uh, when we get rid of the webinar at the same time, there'll be a, a, an extra room in after hours where you get to see all the stuff before the show. We'll, we'll pump stuff in before the stream. So um, so that if you're in after hours, you'll still be able to um, to get there. And by the way, for those who get the email, all the people that have reminded me that they can't find the after hours link this week, um, my fault. <laughs> I just, I cut and pasted, I pulled something out of the email and I accidentally grabbed one extra line, which was the after hours link. So I put it at the top for all of you. Uh, I would highly, we don't, we don't change that uh, meeting number. So I would highly recommend jumping in. So, um, so anyway, uh, but that, that's where we'll have that there. Uh, next question. Andy Carlicchio from Washington, D.C. is up next. Has anyone tried 16 by 9 contributions from mobile in Zoom? It can be enabled in the latest version by enabling HD in the settings. Chris? First off, Andy, we miss seeing you around. I hope the new job's going good. Love to have you drop, drop in and let us know how that's going. Uh, yeah, I, it took me a long time to find it. It's not easy to find on a mobile device, uh, but we did hear about it when it first came out. And I think, I'm pretty sure I changed that. I believe it's global. So you set it up on your device um, and then it's, and then your device will always be in HD. So it's I guess that's kind of 16, I'm sorry. Yeah, 16, yeah. Uh, uh, I, th I think it's, it's potentially a problem. If you go, if you take that device between was it just 16 by nine or is it higher? Well, I think it's, no? I, I don't know whether it's, I, I didn't look at it enough to look whether it was 720 or, eight, or 1080 as, as a contribution, but it is 16 by nine, which is a huge step forward. I mean, it was like, it's like, like we've been, well, you we've do, been dealing with pillar boxes for the last, you know, I don't know how long, um, you know, from the, from the, uh, uh, from mobile devices. And so this is, it's a really exciting upgrade. I actually was going to show it. And somehow I, I sat down on my desk without my iPhone. My, my phone is somewhere in my kitchen, I think, because I was grabbing my coffee. So um, I was going to show it there, but but I think that it's uh, it's it's, it's exciting. Um, so now instead of the pillar boxes, you're getting it. And, I, and again, I haven't had time to test it um, for 720 or, or 1080 as a contribution, but it is definitely um, definitely 16 by nine, and it's uh, awesome. You know, haven't it, it we really had this for a couple of months though? Nope, it's brand new. You you you. you um, oh, maybe the past month. Oh, I didn't think it was that old. Oh, anyway. it's at least a month, if not two, that because okay. I can remember enabling it. Well, someone brought it. Someone brought it up to me the other yesterday, and so then I was. I, maybe this is maybe Andy is 
planting this question because not enough people are using it. Well, we should all use it. 16 by 9. It, 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 it yeah, it's great. It's great to have it. <laughs> I'm curious why it took so long, but I'm but I'm really happy that it's here now. I will not look the gift horse in the mouth. Uh, thank you, Andy. Although I just did, but thank you to Zoom for finally fixing that that problem because it's you know having people in, especially if you're doing a broadcast, um, it is uh, it's really nice to just have them full frame. So it's it's really great. It's right um, here. It's right there in the settings. It's labeled HD video. Yeah, there you go. Not just sixteen by nine. HD. All right. Uh, next question. Next question comes to us from Graham Cardwell in Belfast, Northern Ireland. He says, I'm editing a short announcement video for church, just a multi-clip talking head. What are the panel's thoughts on the best transition between takes? Dissolve, fade through black, flash through white. Thank you. Go ahead, Chris. I can't hear you, Chris. The, the fade through black and white are very stylistic, and sometimes they get shut down real quick. A dissolve can work um but it's um it's kind of a crapshoot you you don't know um you could try a morph cut uh, most of the edit systems have some mm -hmm. sort of a morph cut now um but it's also the 21st century and the kids just like cuts no the kids don't care about it anymore that you could just do cuts it's it's uh, yeah go ahead john I'm typically, if it's like, like a back and forth talking head thing, I'm going to do quick cuts back and forth. Um, otherwise, if I'm changing topics, I'm either going to display something about the next topic or like the church logo flying through as like almost like a stinger. You good, Mitchell. You could also have all of those announcements on one take or one reel. And if you're going to be queuing things up, black is going to work better for you if you cut the black. Because you do a dissolve, you might be cutting in on a dissolve to going in or going out. Um, so okay. and cuts are in. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. All that and compressing for the web uh, dissolves are not your friend. Quick cuts or just any kind of cut between a shot means that the entire raster is replaced once and it's done. When you go through dissolves, particularly long, slow dissolves, the computer has to calculate those interstream stages and sometimes in the encoding. I've even seen it mess up playback on some things. It's getting better, but it, cuts always are the simplest, least complicated, and most, I think, brain not confusing of transitions which is why 90 percent of the music uh, the movies you see use cuts 99 percent of the time also think about um full frame graphics that underline whatever you're announcing <laughs> so so it's really easy to throw i mean that's what we've used these full frame graphics for for a long time is uh is just a, just a basically paper what we call paper over uh, our edits and so i um, throwing up something if you're making an announcement just put something up over top of it just for just for a couple seconds don't do it so quickly that it, it feels jarring and these are simple graphics you can do it in powerpoint or keynote or something like that just type it in of what you're going to do there you don't have to turn it into a broadcast um you know graphic and just throw it up there for a, for a second or two while you're you know over top of those cuts and try to have enough long cuts to make it work. The other thing you can do is, um, if you're going to jump cut, is shoot at a higher resolution and then punch in. So if you instead of just cutting between the same frame, if you're shooting in 4K and delivering at 1080p, for instance, you can have a close up and a wide and a close up and a wide, and that gets you through a lot of those things as well. If you don't want to just do the jump cut. Uh, next question. Mitchell Hill, Wilmington, Delaware, says, I'd like to illuminate the microphone you see in the background. Is there a small enough unit that could mount on the mic itself? Go ahead, Mitchell. I'm just thinking, you know, hey, let's, I've got the background looking right. Let's take it another step. And the uh, Neumann mic you see right there uh, is, is, is hard to tell exactly what it is. So I'm thinking if I light it up, move it a little closer, it might be interesting. Mitch is like, I, Mitch is like I, I spent a lot of money on that mic. I'm going to make sure that I get the full value yeah, out of it. It's a it's a bragging mode. You got you caught me in that one. I'm bragging. <laughs> you know, so it's, for those watching, uh, that, that Neumann mic is expensive. It's more expensive than my Neumann mic, and more expensive than even Bill's Neumann mic. Um, we call that a Mickey, by the way, because Mickey likes the UA. It's the U87, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, Mickey was here before you, Mitchell. So that's that's why he has. And it the was, name. It's significant because it's the first thing I bought in 1978 wow. myself. So and it's you have, my favorite. So I wouldn't put a I wouldn't put a light on the on it. I think that to, to illuminate it, what I would do is get something just out of frame, and you know really focus it on that on that area. So it might be some kind of little Fresnel with a snoot that is just gonna like just push like this little little um, highlight to it. And if you focus that down, it will just be that on that on that piece, and it could look quite nice. 
So, um, you know, uh, Nanlite makes a bunch of little uh, Fresnels, but there's lots of people that make Fresnels, uh, Aperture and, you know, lots of other people. But something that's, that this is where it's not a big open area, it's going to be a, a focused one, and then you're going to get something on the end. And it can be something you can build. <laughs> you can get black wrap paper and just stick it on there and build one. But they, a lot of people make them as well. So that's what I would check out. Go ahead, Bill. To me, it doesn't. It's to me, it's popping out in terms of luminance value. It's just that the fact that it's soft focus because you're working with such a shallow depth of field. So the other thing possible, yeah, I mean, it's there. I can see it, and I, you know, my eye is first attracted to the on air, obviously. But if you change your depth of field a little bit and add more detail to the background uh, and close your aperture essentially on your camera, which would require you to add more light into the scene or add up additional ISO or something. But it's uh, it's clear in my shot. It's against black and it's silver, so mm. it's popping out. And go ahead, Chris. I think it's perfect, Mitchell. You do too, you do too much. No, seriously, you do too much and it looks like a flex, as, this, as the kids say. <laughs> Subtly casually back there i'd even consider i don't know no it's you overdo it and you're trying too hard i think you should get the little lights like vegas and have them just going around chase lights maybe maybe around the circle area yeah there we go i go ahead um uh john i was gonna say the same thing i think it's just a focal length thing if you could make it a little bit clearer maybe a small light on it maybe even a little bit of color to it it could really pop you know, you could build like a little motor in there that just vibrates it every once in a while and just have it go, you know, like just, and then just pull the eye towards it. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Oh, dear. Uh, let's see. Chirag Cheetah, our friend from Dallas, says, finishing up my ATEM Extreme fly pack. Any suggestions on placement of cooling fountains mounted in the case? Right, go ahead, Chris. Yes, put cooling fans in the case. Um <laughs> <laughs> I was trying. I was trying to set up my iPhone so I could show you something. I did a, a. I made a mistake once, and I was doing a recording, and I took the uh, the little Samsung T5, and I was like, uh, and it was attached to the cable. I was like, uh, where am I going to put this? And I just propped it up on top of the um, the HDMI cables, and then leaned it back up against my iMac because it my switcher is right in front of my uh, computer. It nearly fried the T5. It got so hot, I almost couldn't touch it, and the recording corrupted halfway through. Yeah, yeah. yeah so Mitchell. definitely fans. Mitchell, did you? Yeah, do do yourself a favor and first turn the uh, the blinker lights on the uh, ATEM off, because that's where a lot of the heat is coming from. Turn them off or down, and if you're remotely controlling it, turn them off. But um, I, that, that's my recommendation is try to eliminate the source of the heat before you try to I, you know, some other way. I'm not, a, I'm not certain, but I believe that the ATEM pulls from the left to the right. So, um, and someone might be able to correct me on that if I'm wrong, but I think it's left to right. I have mine in an open space, so I haven't thought about it. The reason that that's, that's important is sometimes you can, you can give it a fan on either side that's, a, that's an intake and an exhaust that's just going to push more air through it, um, you know, to, 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 to do that. And that helps. A fair bit you know to to kind of keep it cool yeah go ahead john you want to make sure you're putting positive pressure into the case that you're using and so however many fans you have coming in you're going to have one or more or at least bigger fans on one side of the case versus the other to create that pressure to really move that air through you go ahead uh, bill yeah i just put my hands on my little a10 mini and i think it's right to left i felt cool on the right side and then warm air out the left side which would okay. mean that I'm you'd be backwards. better off yeah putting that so that the closest air opening is on the right side of the a and then what's important is to know which one it is and make sure that you match it so 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 the uh, uh so that you're not pushing air into the exhaust but getting giving it that that throughput um will definitely help keep it cooler uh in that in that process it, a lot of people do front to back and that works for a lot of things the thing to know is like with an ATEM or and with all the black magic stuff now it used to be a lot of different ways that they would handle heating and then they hired someone who actually you know, really specialized in that and suddenly and it's all now one direction to the other and i just can't remember which one i haven't had to build the cases for a while but um uh and what we a lot of times what we do is get those fans you know going one side to the other now we keep open racks I and mean, that's the other thing to think about is just not 
closing the rack up. It depends on what you want it to look like, but we keep open racks because it keeps everything much cooler. Um, next question. Deborah Wood, uh, Wood Fork, here we go, in Washington, D.C., says, looking for eyewear suggestions to use in an open office environment. The lighting in general is very bright and creates eye strain for me. I go ahead, Chris. I don't want to make light of uh, what your the strain is. Uh, it's a serious problem. Interesting story came out about a year or two ago that apparently Bono from U2 actually has, I can't remember if it was catar cataracts or glaucoma or something like that. And part of the reason why he's worn sunglasses for so long is for his eyes. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, it's interesting you should say that, Chris, because I have cataracts. And in fact, Monday I had this one done. And for uh, Monday of this coming week, I'm having this one done. And the first thing I've noticed is there is a sensitivity to light um, after the fact, e even with the pupils returning to their normal di dilation point. But the other weird thing is that things that used to be white to me now are not kind of yellowish. And in my new eye, uh, white is white. It's brilliant light white and it's bluish. So I can understand your concern about getting eye strain. But um, mm -hmm. I think those uh, glasses that they have that are gradual, uh, graduated glasses mm -hmm. that automatically are photosensitive and adjust might be what you're looking for. But I'm not an optometrist, so I can't tell you. You go ahead, Bill. Uh, kind of what Mitch says there, I would suggest you don't take advice from us. I think this is the time to go to an actual professional and get your eyes examined and find out. Because sometimes those little things like, this, you know, I'm getting bright light bothers me more is symptomatic of something beyond something that just a pair of new lenses will take care of. So uh, I protected eyesight is one of the most precious resources you have. And I think this is the time to get real advice on it. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, real quick, uh, uh, the reason I have cataracts in the first place is I've been staring at HMIs too long all my life. Yeah. Uh, I think that you shouldn't be thinking about uh, eyewear, but you should be thinking about scenic. So I think that you, you could put poles up on the corners around your desk and then put a thing over the top and then just hang things down. And then you have a little office. Then, then, then it'll be much, it'll be much, much nicer. I, you know, I, I will say, I, I feel your pain. I, I, as a contractor, worked in a lot of big companies that do the open office, and I'm pretty certain that the popularity of work from home is directly connected to the um, open office. Uh, it is chaos. Like it is the most, like I just, in the time, you know, I, I've never had to be there in, uh, you know, for a long period of time. It's always been, you know, I'm there for a couple of weeks to work on something or, you know, and, I, and I'm in these open offices and I'm like, how do people even think? Like, you know, like you're paying these people all this money. Like, I'm, you know, these are information companies. I'm like, you're paying these people a lot of money and they're working at about a quarter speed because they're in an open office. And it's just, and I know that people think that there's more what, the people think that there's more efficiency because people can hear the conversations around them. That's the argument, but everyone puts headphones on <laughs> like immediately. Like they're just, and man, do people spend a lot of money on headphones if they're in an open office because they want to be able to isolate themselves from everybody else. And, and then when they take it off, I mean, I just, I don't, it is probably one of the biggest boondoggles of corporate America in the last 50 years is the, is the open office. But I, I, I strongly believe that a big reason that people don't want to go back to work is because of that of, of open open offices you know it's just you know that they they just rather they're now at home and suddenly they can think you know and they're not being distracted they don't have to walk out of the room every time they get a call you know like it's just there's just it's just chaos um next question eddie scott in mission viejo california up next with is there a problem with the stream voodoo link in the moaning email i get an oops page uh, we'll have to take a look at it. Uh, I, I say we'll 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 take a look at what that looks like. I haven't tried it, so um, uh, go ahead, uh, John. Yeah, I, I didn't see this either, but this is the specific reason why we use Zoom for remote contribution because they've spent billions of dollars on infrastructure, and and, and we haven't had well, any this issues. Is, I think this is just the I think this is the, just the link to get the deal. Um, let's see here. I am I'm able to get to it, so. I just clicked on the link that went out in the morning and I'm getting a, uh, a connection. So I'm not sure. Hey, go ahead, Tony. I'm getting the oops as well. Um, I've gone through the process. I've reached out to uh, support. And you, you, you just the one that you clicked on the link that is in uh, the email that goes out and you're getting an oops. Well, it's installed on my computer, but it does not allow me to access the, the oh. software. Okay, so that so that what you're saying is is that the the link works to to sign up, and then you're just having trouble getting it to work, and you can't get you can't actually get into Stream Voodoo. Okay, 
we'll take a look at that. So by the way, this is why we're, we put the link out and gave all, everybody 60 days. The stream voodoo is, there's a bunch of, there's a, there are some key things that stream voodoo does that are very interesting and probably not things that, that zoom will do anytime soon. Um, like give us, uh, you know, better compression methods, um, record to disc. So it'll record up to ProRes 444 to your disc if you wanted to, um, while, you know, while you're in the event. Um, there's ways to preview things. There's just a lot of things that I don't think are a Zoom feature. Um, and But it's rough, a little rough around the edges and, and as a mass product. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was have you, you all beta test it. <laughs> so, so it's 60 days of, of us, you know, giving feedback. So, um, and we have a stream voodoo in Discord. So the best place to put it um, uh, is is there. So, you know, definitely let people know. And you, what you will find is that as that the team at Stream Voodoo is uh, really responsive, you know, so um, they'll they'll fix things pretty quickly. So d definitely go into Discord and let people know that things aren't working. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael, uh, looking at terminology, is the term B-roll an anachronism now that we can stack tracks with few limits in an NLE? I go ahead, Mitchell. Well, you're still stacking tracks, but the the fact that it's a B-roll uh, is not really relevant because B-roll refers to an A-B roll editing system, and you're cutting from one thing to the other. So the B-roll would be the second shot, the A-roll the first shot. And when you're shooting, when you're shooting B-roll, you know, you got one person running the, the master shot camera, and then somebody might be doing pickup shots like uh, wide shots, crowd reactions, uh, covering. So... Uh, the term B-roll still applies because it's still it's still film. Hey, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I think it goes all the way back to the film camera days. And so you'd uh, set up film in a camera and you'd do your interview and you'd run through it. Then you'd load up another reel of film, the B-roll, and you'd go out and get any additional shots you needed to amplify what the uh, interviewee was talking about. So I think it just comes over from that. Uh, you know, you can have multiple B-rolls. So, you know, you could call them C, D, E, and F, and G. And it, it did kind of work with the structure of the early NLEs, which were there to uh, kind of uh, ape the structure of that film work because that's where original image making came from. So, you know, I think it's one, one of my shocks in this business was when I had a CEO ask me, so uh, when are we shooting B-roll? And it was like in that transition area, and I didn't expect anybody outside of the industry to know these terms. It has now become essentially common lingua franca in regular society. You tell uh, your next door neighbor that I was shooting B-roll and they'll just nod at you. So it's all changed. Uh, go ahead, Chris. I think what you'd find is that in a traditional um, online suite, edit suite of 40 years ago, you had your primary machine and you would be pulling clips off of that. If you needed to dissolve to another shot, you would have to pull that off of your primary source footage roll it over to your B-roll, your second machine, and then the A machine and the B machine are going into the switcher and they're either literally manually, like you, you perform the edit and you reach over and you pull the fader bar, or as things got more advanced, they would auto trigger that. But to put something on the B-roll, you actually had to copy it off of the A machine to the B machine. Otherwise, an edit suite with just a bunch of cuts would be a source machine and a record machine, but you had to have the source A, source B, B-roll, and then the um, the record machine. And, and uh, Bill, I, I'm, I'm gonna note that I'm having some connection issues. I'm gonna check some stuff on my end, so I'm just gonna let you run with it just for a minute. Copy that. Uh, so we're moving on to the next question. Oh, no, wait a second. That was Chris Fenwick. So good. That's done. Mark Giuliani in Washington, D.C. is up next. He says, I tried to order a Starlink. One address showed the price that I expected, but is not available until 2023. Another address showed as available, but the cost was $2,500 for the hardware and $500 a month. Thoughts? Uh, we don't have anybody who's, you know, this is one of those weird things. I think in the world of online ordering, I have found all sorts of price anom anomalies, even to the level of ordering uh, pants or shirts. You would see them in one price in one place. And we all know about the, the, the idea of if you look 
two or three times on the same website, maybe the third time you come back, they've taken 15% off because there's so much tracking your behavior and they want to actually close the sale. I don't know that that is one of these things going on, but uh, people packaging up a service and uh, pumping up the price a little bit and re-offering it, I think is a thing that goes on a lot out there. Mitchell Hill has some thoughts. Go ahead, Mitch. I, if I lived in the middle of nowhere and it was the only way I could get internet, I wouldn't care so much about the price. It could be 500. It could be a thousand dollars. If I really needed that internet, I'm going to, I'm going to grab it from the best source. Yeah, I, I did. So pricing is, I, I just think pricing is more elastic than it's ever been. And I do think there are a lot of people who are buying up a load yeah. of cheap stuff and putting it on the internet for more money. That's that's actually not not what's happening here. Oh, okay, <laughs> so, great, great. So, so anyway, so um, the uh, the issue is there's a professional version now of Starlink and there's a and there's a private version of Starlink. And so the professional version is twenty five hundred dollars and it's um, it is a much faster connection and a much more reliable connection. It's a different dish, you know, that's come that's come out and it's five hundred bucks a month. So this is for a business to have that connection. Um, you know, and so that is, uh, so that's, that's what that price is. There's no one reselling Starlink. It's impossible. So, so the, uh, so the, the, um, uh, but it's, I have the smaller version that was $500 and a hundred bucks a month. Um, and, uh, so, but that's it. And, and as far as where it's available, that has a lot to do with the downlink space, you know, locations right now. So there's addresses that it's just not serving yet. And you put another address in and it might be right on the line of what it, what it can do. Also, I think that the service areas are larger with the professional ones than they are with the personal ones because it's a different kind of dish and a different service. So it may say, well, this is the only one I can give you is the business one in this area because it has a wider uh, spread. So I think I believe that those are the issues. Um, next question. Thank you for that clarification. I didn't even think about that Starlink being that specialized service. I, I pay a lot more attention to Starlink now that I have one. So, I hear, so, I hear so that. I, so I, I know a lot more about it. I was just so. thinking commodities. Yeah, what's, no, what's a yeah, Starlink? Not, anyway, George Butters from Halifax, Nova Scotia is up next. He says, it's fun watching Office Hours member drive around their location. How would you set this up and what tools would you use, keeping in mind that road safety is the first consideration? Hey, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, it's all fun and games until you run into the ice cream truck. Um, it's funny, George. I'm thinking the same thing when I'm seeing cars driving back and forth. It's like a video game, and you know what's going to ultimately happen. So uh, I just say be careful and keep your eyes on the road. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. I'm waiting for uh, the ability to get my phone and take it out on my bicycle and ride around the neighborhood and do the show from there. But same thing. Be careful. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, I just have a mount on my dash when I do it. And um, I think it's probably a ticketable offense, and I might get pulled over at some point. Uh, but by and large, I'm mostly just talking. Yeah, the um, uh, what I used in <laughs> I, I used to, I was at one point in time I was one of the top ten Meerkat users. Remember Meerkat, the little live thing, and I was one of the top ten users in the world uh, only because it had just come out as pre South by Southwest, and I took a suction cup. You can buy these suction cups with a quarter twenty on it. And so basically I took a suction cup and just put it up to my, uh, my land cruiser that I had in, in Rwanda. And I just drive through Rwanda and have you let you watch <laughs> me get to work and get back. I didn't really look down. I would just, you know, um, I would stop lights. I would look over at the questions coming up and talk about it and talk about whatever I'm doing. And you're not moving very fast in, in, uh, Kigali traffic. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, like a mile an hour. So, um, so during rush hour. So, um, so anyway, uh, so what it is, you can get, there's a variety of different things and what you're looking for. I mean, for, for what I did was a suction cup with a quarter, with a quarter 20 suction cup uh, tri tripod mount. The best ones are the ones that you can get in um, from uh, Film Tools. Film Tools makes them. Now, the, the, the big ones, the, the one that I used, it has a suction cup and then it has this little button that you push in and it's, it, it sucks it in. That thing will... I mean, tear your paint off before it go before it, it releases from your car because it's what it's used for is the outside of the car, not the inside of the car. But it'll work great on glass. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so you push it up, you push it up, you 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 push it up, and then you push this little thing, and it and it becomes part of the surface, um, pretty pretty quickly. And then that one has a quarter twenty or sometimes a three eighths, and then that's just a matter of getting like a little arm. You can get a Noga arm. You can get a um, you know, there's a variety of different arms that you can get for that. And then you have a you know. Some one of those little mounts um, that that you can get for your your tripod. Like this one is for the one. This would be the easiest one because this is I don't have my cell phone with me, but this one just snaps 
So this is from Peak, Peak, Peak Design. This one would just snap onto my phone um, really quickly. So you could do you could do something like that. Next question. Vic Sinise in uh, Loyal, Indiana says, can you explain HLS streaming protocol and when this should be utilized? So pretty much most of the delivery of a live stream is delivered to you by HLS. So what HLS does is it it basically, it's it's not really a, I mean, it's a streaming platform. It's a streaming protocol, but it's, um, but it is how, like when you watch YouTube, when you watch Netflix, when you watch Apple TV, when you, all of these MLB, these are all HLS. And what HLS does is it says, I'm going to send you packets but they're only going to last a little while on your, you know, and we can just, we can set that how long they last, but they're only going to last a little time when they get to the destination so that we, that we don't fill up your hard drive. So each one of those packets is being sent to you. So you're just getting a stream. Um, you know, you're just basically getting a stream of blocks. These blocks are usually two to six seconds long. They, we call them segments. And so we're dropping these blocks down, you know, six, sec six segments at a time. Now, what we call the buffer is that we don't tell you that those segments are there until a certain number of them are already there. So if I have, if I set, like if I set this to um, like a pretty typical thing would be that I might set my segments to let's say six seconds and I'll say, I want to have a buffer of 10 segments. So now I have a one minute buffer, um, you know, that's out there. Now, why, why do you do that? It's so that your internet is going up and down like this. And what you want to do is make sure that you're always getting the frames and you're never losing the frames. And the HLS is really, really good at that. So it's got a, a little buffer that sits inside of your computer that's constantly buffering ahead. Um, and, and different uh, applications, like some of them might do a half an hour, one hour, 20, a two hour buffer where they're constantly trying to fill that up. They may not, they may start playing, but they'll, they'll, they'll start, they'll keep on adding these little segments to it. Um, anyway, so these are the, the segments that, that, that it adds. Um, and then it has a, you know, after you've seen the segment, throw that one away, you know, otherwise your hard drive would fill up. <laughs> so um, now oftentimes those time, what we call time to live is longer. That means that you can rewind. So if you think that if you jump to something that doesn't rewind very well, it means it's throwing away those segments really fast. Um, a lot of your uh, over the top um, uh, boxes will hold it for a long time. It hold, oftentimes they have enough RAM or enough not storage to hold a whole movie or maybe even sometimes a couple of them. And that way you can fast forward and rewind back and forth because they're now local to you as they start to work. So um, you don't, the, the place that you, as a con contributor, where you use HLS is if you're doing the direct delivery to the CDN. So if, if I'm streaming to Akamai or I'm streaming to AWS or something, or, or if I'm doing HDR, which we do sometimes to YouTube, um, I'm gonna deliver that as an HLS segment. Um, and uh, um, because, they need that and i might even deliver now with youtube you just deliver one but with with akamai or something like that i'll i'll do all the all the um segments and what i mean by that is the ladder there's a ladder and i'm giving you 1080 um and 720 and you know 480 whatever all of these segments are available to me in my player and that the reason that it's so important why hls is so cool is if your player starts having trouble with the 1080, if that buffer starts getting smaller, it'll just jump down and grab the 720. You know, and you'll see it drop because it, it, and it can do that every, at the size of your segments. So if your segments are two seconds or six seconds or whatever, it can go, oh, I'm gonna jump down to one because my buffer isn't keeping up. And you'll never, as a viewer, you should, I mean, you don't always have this happen, but shouldn't see anything happen. It should just grab the right segment as it goes through. This is not usually, unless you're doing industrial strength streams, um, this is not something you would typically do as a delivery method. Um, you'll typically, but this is how almost every service that you see delivers their video signal to you. Um, and if you want to see it, by the way, there's a, if you, I think you hold down the option key or control key in YouTube and you'll see an option to go uh, stats for geeks, I think, or stats for nerds. I can't remember which one. And what you'll see is the bandwidth and you'll see this thing where it goes like this, it goes Doot. It's like a heartbeat that goes there that, that's, that's in your, like your bandwidth usage. What that is, is if you have a fast connection, it says I grabbed my next buffer and then I'm waiting for it here and I'm going to grab another one. So that if it, if it, if it doesn't have this, it means that your, your bandwidth is very close to your buffer. Anyway, there, hopefully that helps. We did do a talk on HLS. If you go back into our archives, I think I did a talk about it um, that's more detailed than the four minutes that I spent on this. Uh, next question. 
Zach Marley's up next from Denton, Texas. He says, I'm currently planning a new studio build. I'll be running Cat 6 cable for the network and Dante. I'm also thinking about some SDI runs. Any other cabling I should consider running? Go ahead, John. I wouldn't run 6. If you're going to run any, any copper at all, run 7, possibly 8. 6 is designed for 1 gig. 6A is 10 gig. But I would run fiber, mostly fiber, and then probably seven or eight cat category, seven category. Eight. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. I would be uh, more concerned with cable management so that uh, – because you can't anticipate every scenario as far as cabling goes. And there may be something else coming out that we don't know about yet. Uh, but if you have like a cage uh, system that uh, either runs in the ceiling or underneath the front of your desk, uh, I have – a it's a, it's literally like a – a clothing hamper cage that I just lay the wires in and it runs it around and it's, it keeps it all neat and tidy. So I think that's your best way to f anticipate what's going to come down the road. Go ahead, John. I recommend, yeah, just like John Prado said, CAT 6A at a minimum is what you're going to want to run. Um, it's going to be really great for distance um, uh, and using that high bandwidth. Uh, I would always include SDI, run double the amount of whatever you need, plan for failure. Uh, depending on how structured this is going to be, your lifetime of the product, it's always going to be good to have a pull through t a tape or string. Whatever you're doing, always have that there. It's going to be a lifesaver when you need to run something new. Go ahead, Bill. On this same thing, when I was building out my studio back in Scottsdale, I actually put two four-inch conduit tubes and ran them to uh, specific places. One, I wanted to keep power in, the other keep signal cables in, and I was pulling and re-pulling and pulling out and replacing cables over the 10, 12 years I was there multiple times. So some simple, easy, with big sweeping bends, pull raceway that you can get cables to wherever you need to and um, from wherever you need to save my bacon lots of times yeah I, I am finally i've already started buying all the materials i'm, I'm finally going to rewire my house it's got some kind of service in most of the rooms but i need i'm ready to upgrade that service it's like it's just a single cat five um i'm putting one cat seven two coax you know for sdi and uh, one tac 12. <laughs> So, so that I think that that will handle the the lifetime of my house, you know. So, you know, the the, the coax is there, the Cat Seven because it does a lot of things. You know, I can move lots of things around. I'm going to move Dante and stuff like that. Um, the cat, the two coaxes is just so that, you know, it's just easy for me to just run some video back and forth. Um, and then the Cat, the um, Tac Twelve is twelve strands of tactical fiber. Um, which means that I can I can run as many cameras as much data as I'd want to go back and forth, and I just want to do this one more time, and then and then I'm not going to do it anymore. <laughs> so I'm just going to deal. I'm going to live with that for. I think I'll I'll be you know farming by the time I need to change it. Uh, next question. Todd Rains in Allen, Texas is up next. What's the name of the mobile app that you use to control the Blackmagic cameras? I see there are a couple of options. I use the Bluetooth Plus app. Um, this is the one that actually Black Magic makes. I mean, that's the one that I use the most. But I, I don't. I don't. There's a lot of them, and they're they all work fairly well. Go ahead, John. Bluetooth Plus is really good, and it also has the multi-camera control. So if you're dealing with multiples, it's a really yeah. nice feature. Yeah, if you have like three cameras, they'll show up as a little list, and you can jump into each one of them, do the settings. Uh, it works well. Um, next question. Next one comes from David Paskin in Miami, Florida. He says, can we talk again about how important it is to teach the world how to present and teach well in digital spaces and physically for that matter? Uh, go ahead, uh, John. You know, a great start on this is to watch John. Is it Snyder, Alex? Our uh, guy yeah. on, did a great job. His, his little primer on how to present, whether it's keynote or PowerPoint, doesn't matter, is fantastic. I suggest everybody watch it. Yeah, go ahead, David. Here's my concern. We've talked a lot about how um, one of the best ways to teach the world this is is to do it, right? Is to present ourselves in a in a in a in a good way with good audio, with good video, and and good presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, over the past week, I've had uh, I've been involved in a a government presentation, a religious presentation, and an educational presentation, and they were all terrible, really, really terrible. And I found myself just wanting to scream and 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 help. I'm wondering if there's more that we can do other than do it well ourselves. Yeah, one of the things that we are going to do is um, for the education hours, we're, the education hours have become largely philosophical and I think we're gonna veer back towards the technical. So we'll still talk, we'll still have some technical, like, so what we were doing is having education be two hours and then have a technical thing at 10. 
Um, I think that where we're going to go with it is we're going to have the first Q&A, and then we're going to have educational-based tech talk at 9 or 8, like right after the first one. So it'll be technical discussion. And then still have we can still bleed off into other conversations about education in the third hour of the day. Um, but rather than putting it at the end of that, so that way people who are more technically minded also can jump into the, are more likely to stay from the first hour to the second hour and that aren't in education um, and be part of that conversation. But I think that a lot of times it's going to be a true second hour. So like we have, you know, loosely audio and video, you know, business kind of ideas on Monday. Um, Tuesday is a, uh, you know, a audio and video. Wednesday's more graphics. Thursday's more con um, talent. Uh, Friday's more, you know, kind of logistics. Saturday will be more education driven. So, but it'll be presenting things and bringing people in to talk about it and th those types of things. But on that second hour, then we'll leave the, we'll have an open-ended, you know, kind of conversation that happens after that. But I think that, you know, it's, we, we've been, uh, I know Emily and I have been talking about it a little bit in the back end. So I think that we're going to uh, do that. And when we'll make that change is right after uh, the 19th. So the 19th, the second hour and onward will be the launch. So, so we're, you know, um, so we, and I did check that with Emily and that's fine. So we'll do the first hour of Q and a, then we'll stop and go into the, into the rocket launch from then on that second hour will be a technical talk and it will be, and it'll be a definitely about presenting. It'll be about building educational graphics. It'll be about, you know, and we'll show more, more of those things. And if you're interested in showing those things as an educator or as a presenter, um, definitely uh, let us know because we're going to start scheduling that um, that way. Um, go ahead, Bill. So when I married my wife, she was a school teacher teaching fifth grade in a pretty large school district. She eventually became an instructional specialist and worked across all the districts for them and other things. And I, one of the things that I learned over my many years of talking to her after work was the incredible skill set that really good teachers have to embody. It's real simple for me to teach somebody who thinks and acts like I do. Uh, we we kind of connect and I know at what level to target the information going out so that that receiver receives it. In her case, her struggle was always, you know, a, a teacher walks into a room of students who are all different in terms of their ability to absorb information, the kinds of things that will make a lasting impression as opposed to just wake them up for a second, but they won't retain the information. And it's such a deep skill that the, um, the devaluation of those skills for instructors has been one of the saddest things I've seen watching the school districts just across the country not pay and respect mm -hmm. the amount of hard effort it yep. takes to be really good at that. So I'm just saying if you're going into this thing to teach, and you have my infinite respect for doing that, but it takes some effort. It's not just I know this really well, I can stand up and I can do a great job of teaching. There's just tons of techniques There's to reach people right. There is. I, what I will say is there's there's a lot of ball handling skills that most teachers don't have, you know, like and that's the thing that we that that we want to try to fill in on Saturdays. And, and so the, the teachers, um, I mean, I see it with my I, I don't know about all teachers. I just know about my kids teachers and I can tell you that they don't have any of the ball handling skills. <laughs> so, so anyway, so it's and as a parent who does educational materials, it's truly painful for me to watch. And so and it's not their fault. They're not taught that in school. They're not given that, and then they're stuck into a, a very an, an un uh, a painful situation <laughs> with a lot of chaos without the tools that they need. So what we need to do, what I really started thinking about, I'm a, you know I'm I tend to be not one that complains without a plan, and so you know if I'm complaining about it, it means I got to do something about it. And I think that to David's point, um, you know I think what we need to do is build more of those resources for folks to know about the technologies that are out there, but also just the basics like, you know the lectures don't work <laughs> like you know they don't they're like anything more than five minutes is a, is a waste of time um and um and that uh slides with lots of text don't work you know and so and those just just take those two things out create conversations uh you know flip the classroom which most people know works um you know those those types of things but but then then it comes down to the technology and the technique um, we, we didn't have a very large crew today, but we, we, we succeeded in going very slowly through our stuff. So I had a good conversation. It was comfortable. So I was, I wasn't sure how this would go with so few people, but I actually kind of enjoyed it. So we'll, we'll, um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes anyway. And I apologize for the, the other two people. We're going to shift gears here. 
So we are uh, are shifting gears for our second hour, and um, we again have Jeffrey Worthwine and Andrew Sullivan here, um, and uh, old friends of mine, uh, and uh, not uh, old, not not old in age. Although we are getting kind of old in age, but but long long time friends, long time friends uh, the, the, that we've had here, and and so um, really really gra- uh, glad to have you guys back. And for those watching, um, the. Uh, uh, and while you're watching this, as they walk, as we walk through, it'll probably take 15, 20 minutes to walk through what the, what uh, Jeffrey and, and Andrew have to show us, and then uh, but but throw those questions into um, into into the Mukana, and we will ask them uh, right after we get to the end of that. So, um, what do you have to show us today? Uh, yeah, well, today we're going to talk uh, about our location scouting. Um, as with any production, you know, you're gonna you got to get out to the to location, see what the see what they're dealing with. Um, and the, beyond just a, a tech scout of, you know, what, what the infrastructure in the place is, um, you know, obviously we're, we're looking into the, the house, uh, that the story will take place in, um, the, for those who weren't here last time, uh, mm-hmm. you know, our, our script largely takes place, uh, in one house, uh, you want to tell them a little bit about the film. I don't want to drink your blood anymore. Uh, yeah, that's the title. Um, isn't it the short a- title? I know. It's, again, our last film was called Boca, so I've gone from <laughs> went, went the other way. Word to eight words, nothing in between. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It's a film about a vampire who suffers from agoraphobia, and we kind of watch her journey over a 50-year period. So I'm really having an understanding of the house she's going to live in, how we're going to treat that house decade to decade, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, all the way 2022, basically. And so um, having as much information from images, from models, from anything we can do with the house actually helps us a lot as we're um, in our last two weeks of pre-production right now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're, we're a, a small independent film, so we don't necessarily have the, the, the budget to commit to bring the entire team uh, on location for, you know, uh, a full walkthrough. Uh, we've done two now, uh, one at the initial kind of assessment of the location and then the second one with the art department looking specifically at uh how we'll dress the 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 various rooms of our main house um but uh you know part of it is you know again the the working remotely which we're all doing so um we took uh all the uh all the usual photographs that that one would take which uh we could show you but you know it's photographs of a house i'm not sure how dazzling that is uh the 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 part that got a, a little more fun was uh i i did some basic uh, 3d modeling of the spaces just with the with the iphone uh what did you use well um i can pull it up here for you uh let me let's see i have to say that that some of these apps are getting really really good um yeah yeah and and yep. this is this is a pretty basic one you can see here it's uh just 3d scanner app the one on the left here um and you use 3d scanner over polycam i i did simply because uh, I, I can't remember why I tried Polycam, um, which was, I use. I use Polycam a lot. And yeah, I, yeah. But but I, the uh, but the three I've I've had three D scanner as well. It works well. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, um, oh, I think there was a, the exporting on Polycam was uh, there wasn't as many, or I had to like mm-hmm. pay a bunch extra to. to export the models and i, I, I paid them <laughs> so yeah, yeah it works great <laughs> so, so, so. I, was, I was still in a testing phase i'm like yeah, i don't yeah. know if i want to pay. oh and i think it, it wasn't just paying it was like i had to subscribe to like a eight dollar monthly fee and i was like i'm not ready for that kind of commitment yeah, when i'm yeah, still exactly. just testing this out um and at that point i was all in on 3d scanner uh so that's where i went um it's amazing you know, though that you can take a phone into a space and just wave it around and you end up with a 3d model it's amazing. Crazy. And I mean, like, you're not going to use this for, you know, but, but, but uh, I, there's a lot of amazing purpose. I was talking to a friend of mine who's uh, done a lot of professional painting and I was showing him uh, these models and he was like, Oh, just like the, 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 the doors that opened up for him, just in like estimating how much paint to buy when he's, you know, painting a wall. Uh, it was, it was kind of amazing. Um, and that's a lot. That's honestly the kind of world we're living in of like, can we put a dolly, in, you know, behind a couch here? You know, you know, there, there was a uh, I was talking to the guys that did previs for um, Panic Room and that was a uh, and, and uh, David Fincher and they they prevised 
he really wanted to previs everything and they had a technocrane and they modeled a technocrane like the technocrane that they're going to use and they put it into the into the in the model of the set that they were going to use and they you know they had this it was on a track and then it came back and it moved around and when they showed it to the dp he was like there's no way that's going to work like there's not enough room in there and like oh yeah there is there's four inches <laughs> Like four inches of clearance, and he's like, "There's no way you can do that." Sure enough, came in for when they, they took a picture of it and sent it. You know, like like to make sure he, he remembered what that was. Like four inches is it will work. So uh, that's, it, it's that's really crazy. Cool. I'm sure I'm sure much more specific modeling than uh, than what I'm about to show. Uh, <laughs> no, but the, the thing is, is it's it's really accurate because you're using the new iPhone. Yeah, well, the twelve. Yeah, uh, that's I, I, new and new enough. It's got the enough. lidar in it. I mean, that lidar that's is going to be pretty accurate. Yeah, um, let me let me pull up here. All right, so here you are. You can uh, all right. So this is the, the let me pull up in one of the scans uh, that I that I took. So this is all right. This is our uh, upstairs hallway. Um, and uh, so I, I did a pretty extensive one because we're gonna be we're gonna wow. be doing some stuff in this hallway. Um, so it's across. And you did it all in one capture, right? You're walking down the hall. Yeah, and this capture probably mm. took me you know 10 minutes of waving around rooms but yep. i specifically wanted to like get get uh down here into this staircase that comes up into the hallway yep. um and then you know there's there's one of the bedroom doors and while it looks a little rough um it is uh it really helps to be able to think about where oh things are in relationship to each other it's it's huge uh and you can see there's this there's a sort of dog leg in the hallway here um mm -hmm. and kind of just understanding the dynamics of that uh, particularly when when we're talking about how to shoot you know so um if we're going to shoot in a hallway which is really tight i mean this is this is a stand and this is an old old house so there there's not there's not extra room it wasn't built to code uh you know any of that but we can look in here and like, okay, we can, we can put a, a camera in a doorway or, uh, or, you know, um, uh, deep in another room to kind of shoot out into the hallway. Um, and, and looking at all this has been really helpful, um, not just with, uh, the art department, but as we're, you know, talking with the director of photography, um, and the, the entire crew really of just how we, how, where are we going to put people, where are we going to put the gear, how are we going to stage a scene? um in in a pretty tight space like this it's a long hallway but it's very tight and there's actually two staircases you can see there's a back staircase right. there and then up and over here there's the there's the front staircase and the the image quality you know is it, it gets a little rough um but that's that's kind of, that's fine you know um and uh let's see what else oh the um so the the uh the basic idea here is, um, let me, uh, I'll come back here. Uh, so the, you, you do the scan pretty easily. Um, right. and, uh, you know, why don't and I, that will, I, will that export as a USDZ? It will. And that's, yeah. that's kind of the, the to scale to scale. So like, like if you, yeah, I mean, yeah. and that's, that. I, I think that was another, actually, that was one of the other reasons I went to a 3d scanner. I don't know if Polycam does USDZ. It does JLB it, it does. and a bunch of other things. Yeah. Um, but uh you know usdz's for a crew like i'm not going to ask the production designer to open blender or whatever um although i don't know they, they she may know actually um, sure. yeah <laughs> but uh <laughs> you know uh usdz's will just play natively in preview on a mac um well and you can also just text it to somebody and if they if they have their phone, if you text it to somebody, they need to click yeah. on it. And, but the funny thing is it shows up at scale. So if you're in a house that doesn't match the house that you're in, you'll just see mm -hmm. your house mixed with the other house. It's a little yeah. Surreal. So uh, I, in sharing it with everybody, I went over and I, I did export them all out. Let me, let me take us over here to, so this is uh, that same scan. I'm just here on my desktop in a Mac, on a Mac. Uh, this is just, as you can see up here, just preview. Um, and it's it's the same model, you know, and uh, which is nicer because there's certainly a bigger screen here <laughs> um, th than just the iPhone screen. Uh, just super easy to 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 jump from one to the other and to send out to anyone who's on a Mac. And I'm sure I'm sure there's a Windows equivalent of you know just a basic 3D viewer. Um, another really great thing that we found this is this is one of the bedrooms off the upstairs hallway, um, and. Uh, you can see this one is uh well it's a much smaller space so there's there's a little bit more detail i also spent quite a bit of time getting uh getting the detail of this um 
and you know when, when you when you go real close it starts to you know detail becomes a bit of a um very qualified statement <laughs> uh but you know again you can you can check out you know how how close we are with the swing of these doors a big thing uh that i wanted to look at was uh the size of these closets there's a there's a shallow one here and a deeper one over here um and the the uh, the doorway here uh, swings out into this piece of furniture, which which uh, might be might be staying. Um, so yeah, I mean it's. Uh, and you're using most of the furniture that's there. I mean you're you're not. No, most of it'll get cleared out. Oh, got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that big piece I just showed you that that nearly runs into the door. I don't know if we're we're going to clear that out. Half that's mm -hmm. half of those are antiques, so it's a lot of right. taking a lot of care to uh, um, uh, not, not damage the, the property. Yeah, I mean we're honestly the the production team's going to be in there uh a week before we are a week before we are just kind of clearing out the valuables and right. and securing all the 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 private stuff um oh there was a there was another thing i'll go back to that same scan on the phone um all right so this is the same scan oh the thing that uh this is a little bit more thing. detailed because you just kind of focused on one room Yes. Yeah. This was, and you can see the, uh, the hallway from the other scan, but this was just, uh, and again, the thing to remember is, is that if you text that to somebody as an, a USDZ, someone on an iPhone, they can oh, literally yeah. stand in that room and walk around. Like, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, it'll come to them as now they can also just pinch and squeeze it down and set it yeah. on a table and then walk around it as well. Like look around it. I mean, and so for, it's, for a production designer, it's everything when you're thinking about, all right, I'm going to do one accent wall and wallpaper. Which wall do I want? Do I want to look around the room for a DP? It's yeah. obviously everything in terms of like, all right, if we're replacing the bed, a queen, a queen or a king yeah. size bed with a full bed, how much room do I have to walk around this? Where are we going to put the dresser? Where mm -hmm. are we going to? So, I mean, there's, um, it encourages more questions in a detailed way that you can't do when just looking at a photo. Yeah. So at the bottom, the little yellow button, uh, it's got some some basic measuring options. Uh, so just again, kind of from the from the painter's perspective, uh, basic basic tape measure. I can just go from from drop a, a, a starting point at one door, a drop a starting point, end point at the other door, and okay, so that's a that's about. And I've feet. tested this; it's remarkably accurate. You yeah. know, if you get if you get those points right, and um, and and it's it, it's so nice because I used to sit there and spend a half an hour measuring the door jams and measuring the the space yep. between and measuring the overall space and it's all kind of you know all over the place. It took a long time and now I literally just go in and just wave my phone around and I'm like, okay, I, I, yeah. I'll be able to figure this out later. It's uh, it's pretty fantastic. Um, and again, this this is uh, this is the free version of the app. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a desktop app, but that's more for object modeling and not for uh, real estate. Um, right. But oh, the other here. Why don't I? Uh, all right. So there's my little eight. I'll just do a very quick. Here we are. There's uh, there we are. Okay. I'm going to just start up a scan here, and you can see uh, you know the mesh that's building the readout. So I'm just scanning right now. The uh, my desktop, my, my cluttery desktop. Yeah, there you go. Um, and there we are. And you can see uh, it just building it out uh, as you wave it around. It's just magical for someone who's been doing these for a long time. Oh man, it's, Magic. it's crazy. Yeah. So, uh, oh, this is another really thing that <laughs> was very beneficial. LiDAR scans, as you might uh, imagine, um, suck down the battery. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So we're on location. I go into a location fully charged. Um, but it does an initial scan. You can see here, there's a, you, uh, it needs to process it afterwards, which is essentially merging the detail with the, uh, just the, the 3d, um, uh, architecture of it, yeah. which I can do now, or you can process later. So what I would do is we'd go into a house. We would, uh, I would scan them all. Uh, I, I'll just back out of this one right now. So that's my untitled scan. Um, so I could move quickly. Uh, yeah. and then, uh, when we got in the car and we were driving to the next location, I'd come back in here. Uh, I go back to process and you can choose the various things. I'm just going to, of course, hit HD because I want the best one. Um, this one's only 45 seconds, but you uh, to to process. Yeah, you, you start see, doing a detailed one. And it starts adding up. Yeah. And, you know, you could see I I, uh, I was uh, waving it around my desk for what, 10 seconds, 15 right. seconds. So um, when, when I was waving it around for 10 minutes, it took some time to process. Uh, and by the time I finished processing the scan, 
yeah, my battery was like, <laughs> yeah. get, get in the car, plug in the, plug in the phone to recharge, uh, all the scanning and then the processing. All right. So we're done here. So now, um, now I'm showing you all my office, uh, or at least a little bit about my desktop here. Um, not, not perfect, not awesome, but, uh, also you spend a little more time. Yeah, more and, detail. and it doesn't it doesn't do as well with small objects like like the desk, you know, to yeah. get that that data as it does in like gathering the room. That's what I find. Yeah, um, and it kind of has two different modes. There's there's the real estate mode, and then there's the small object mode. Right. Um, and here, let's do this. Uh, so coming back here, uh, you can see on the bottom right there it says normal. Um, there's lidar, lidar advanced, post uh, point cloud, and true depth. And these all do different things. Um, right. Let's go some true. Come, I, I will say that the, this app has come a long way since the last time I tested it. So now watching you, I'm like, oh, I have to go back and play with it some more again. It's it's a lot of fun. Uh, all yeah. right, so this is advanced, and you can uh, obviously I want uh, high uh, all of it. Um, so we'll start, and you'll see that the interface is a little bit different. It's it's already grabbed with the the object, which in this case is my A10 Mini. Um, and it's kind of getting a sense of, of uh, that. I'd have to like, you know, go all the way around it and it's kind of tucked back in there. So I can't, but uh, right, right, right. that would be, yeah, that's gonna need a lot of processing. Yeah. It, well, uh, it, it, again, a lot of times I found that it, the, a lot of these, the, the photogram is where photogrammetry really comes in. So the new object capture stuff that Apple built uh, does yeah. a lot better than the LiDAR does, you know, to make that work. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. Um, but, you know, I have, what 12 or 14 scans of our That's location key. i mean it's so all. important like yeah. i i would i would just say it's almost a requirement if you're going to do previs to have a phone with a with lidar built into it yeah i mean i i think for us we're always trying to solve what we don't have right when right. we don't have the budget when we don't have the amount of trips we can do our locations in massachusetts not new jersey it's not an hour away we can't just go to the house whenever even if we could the owners you want to respect their time and and make sure right. you're doing it at an important moment so just we're trying to have as much detailed conversations as early as possible in pre-production. And this helps that out a lot. When I get yeah. wallpaper swatches from our production designer, like mm -hmm. she now knows exactly how the room works and what she wants a backsplash, where she wants wallpaper, how she wants a rug to look within the room. And so just every conversation is a bit more granular um, than if we were just looking at photos. Cause normally how a photo conversation starts is I really wish I knew where the light was coming from in the photo and, yeah. and what you did, right? You think that, and, and what happens is when you take a bunch of, you take a couple hundred photos and then you do the LIDAR, they can, it makes way more sense. When they look at the photos, they understand what they're looking at, you know? Absolutely. Context. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me, there's another, uh, pretty excellent thing on this. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of cool things. One thing, mm -hmm. let me go back to the phone here for a second. Uh, at the there's an AR uh, function at the bottom. Um, if you want to, again, that's more for objects uh, mm -hmm. where you want to view it uh, in augmented reality, which which doesn't really apply to rooms. Um, but it's got GPS, which I enabled at one point, so um, you can see here <laughs> all uh, the places you scanned. Yeah. Yeah, the the place I scan, and uh, I'm not going to zoom all the way in because uh, there's a there's a private residence out there somewhere. Um, but uh, the um, the GPS is pretty accurate. Uh, yeah. When uh, when so when I, I I moved into a new house uh, last fall, and um, I was doing these scans when we were moving in because we were having all kinds of conversations just moving into the new place. Yep. Um, all all the same conversations really. I was location scouting my new residence. Uh, anyway. Um, and I looked at the I looked at the scans afterwards, like, oh, that GPS again, incredibly accurate. Like you can see which room of the house. Like when you zoom in close enough, it's it's really phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So, what did you do with all these scans after that? Um, well, I export them out to USDZ, um, right. and I've uh, yeah, I basically just put them on a drive, uh, a, a cloud with Google Drive, um, and shared it out with the crew, um, and. Yeah, everybody's everybody's been looking at them, and uh, yeah, it's been a it's been helpful in the conversations. No, absolutely. And then, I, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, definitely for Jeff and I, there are scenes that happen in the upstairs hallway that we weren't convinced we could have in the upstairs hallway. It's great of how long it is, yeah. but it is thin, and so just right. being able to see where we could open bedroom doors for the camera, where we could shoot and just ride the wall basically and do a tracking shot and yeah. where we can shoot from just an angle, lower angle from the top of the stairwell, basically 
um, up yeah. through the bars of the, uh, of the fencing is just like, it's everything right now in terms of just, you're, you're always having to figure out, can we do the shots in this location? Do we have to move it downstairs? If we move it downstairs, will that make sense narratively? And so you're just yeah. trying to solve as many story points as possible. And, and the thing that isn't quite tied together yet, but we're, uh, some of us are thinking about right now is how do I take that LIDAR convert it to a low poly, you know, just take it into SketchUp or something else and build a low poly version from that using that as a base. Yeah. Um, and then get it to Unreal and be able to drop metahumans in where they can just kind of sit in there, you know, so that, because if we get the scale right, it means that you can really block things, you know, and yeah. it's not all done yet, but a lot of us are thinking about like, how do we use that that whole pipeline um, to to tie that together? I I, uh, I experimented with the you know, the very low end version of that where uh, after our first location scout and I had the scans of the room, uh, you know we talked last time about storyboarder and how we were blocking all that out. Mm -hmm. That is a 3D environment and you can import uh, not USDZs but you can import GLBs. So yep. I uh, exported as a GLB and imported it um, and it imported the model. Uh, the lighting was all messed up and the texture was a disaster, so it wasn't functional yet. But I, right. but I imported the GLB straight out of 3D Scanner. So I think if I were to, you know, bring bring the 3D scan into like right. a, a Blender or Blender. something, make a mm -hmm. more appropriate uh, uh, model, and then get it out, yeah. we we could literally be storyboarding in the room uh, that yeah. that we're going to shoot in, which would yeah. be that that would be a lot of fun. Um, It'd be a little a, time consuming right now, but it's a pipeline, you know. So the the what what we've been looking at is the idea, and we'll jump to the next thing in a second. But what, take the scan into SketchUp because SketchUp has a great texture mapping tools and then just snap to point, you know, just snap to the points and just build a square, you know, that, that is the size right. of that. And then just throw the text. You, you still take the picture separately, but you just throw those textures on and, and then it, then you just export that model out and it'll, it'll, it'll be much better. <laughs> so yeah. it's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, and, and that's the, the next step that we're kind of playing with. Now you've got the models, you've done the previs, and then you're going into, you're managing shots. How do you plan the shots out for that, for that process? Well, that's been a lot of what Andy's been working on pretty hard. Yeah, it's uh, uh, so we're it's kind of a one two punch. The last time we were here, we talked about uh, for those who either were here last time or weren't, uh, we were using a program called Storyboarder, where we basically mm -hmm. <laughs> storyboarded the entire film, about 950 still images of 3D models in various positions, put it into Final Cut Pro. Jeff did an edit of like a 35 minute version of our entire movie. Um, which we shared with our crew. We also shared with our cast. We were just, we told our cast, like, maybe this will help for you. Maybe it'll get in the way of, of what you're thinking of doing process wise, use it, don't use it. It's fine. But for our crew, if nothing else, it's just like, it was the easiest way to communicate what's in my head in a visual format. Right. And so yep. not only and, that, and it, it's just, a great start of a conversation, you know, like just being able to say, this is what I'm thinking. And they go, well, it'd be really good if we did this. And, and that's what you want to do before you have a set and you're trying to, you know, do a certain number of shots a day. It also, I think animating the storyboards, not so much animating, but like cutting them into a storyboard film, you know, it's all static shots, basically. Although in Final Cut, right. I did like do some push-ins and, and stuff like that on, on a few shots to, to kind of intimate a uh, camera movement. Um, but it, it, it just, it really helps establish a tone. You know, I think just the, the, even the rhythm of static 3D model storyboards uh, with a little music, the occasional sound effect, it's like, okay, this is a, a, a preview into the world that we're building. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's um, I'm always trying to create dartboards for people like just like here's something to look at, throw darts at it. Let's have a conversation either to make it more like this or less like this. Right. But anytime I can create a dartboard um, and again, for um, our DP, Una and myself, normally when you're shot listing, you're looking at the scripts and you're either doing chicken scratch on paper. You're like moving your hand going two people here. Camera turns here, hold up a phone as a door or a table. They walk around this way, right? You're tracking, you're panning, you're whatever. And so having that storyboard and script was a hell of a one-two punch for us in terms of just being able to get ready to shot list and talk about angles and how can we make it more efficient. Because the challenge in this, um, it sounds like we're making a cabin in the woods type of film that's 80 to 90% one house. There's some truth in it. The complexity that I've introduced into this one that doesn't make it that way is it happens over 50 years, which means sets change within location. And there are a lot of um, people coming in and out of the house over that time. Is so that actually, so we have basically 200 ish scenes in this film 
that right there is 200 shots, no matter what. Yes, maybe 30 are redundant, but it's <laughs> that's your basis. And then you're building another, maybe some scenes have two shots all the way to some scenes have seven or eight. And so this week, it's kind of for myself spending about 20 hours. I use a program called Shot Lister basically to list every single shot we have in terms of uh, at least a first draft of it. And then Una or DP will look at it. What has been great about using Storyboarder before was I'm starting with 950 still images that I'm looking at compared to the script. And so I basically am now using the storyboard mm -hmm. as a way to drive how I think about shots. And that's just having a visual tool right. to basic. I mean, again, this film, it's it's always funny when you're making something like this. You start with written words, which you then turn into a visual storyboard so that you can turn it back into written words of a shot list, right? And right. so- right. Um, And how does shot lister, you, how, how does shot lister right. work? Uh, yeah, uh, let's uh, let's go over to Andy's uh, machine here. Not nearly as sexy as how it works compared to what Jeff was showing, right? But it's uh, <laughs> um, on the left. I'm not going to go to show the whole thing, but it's like it's every scene um, and a detailed description of every scene. I'm not going into all that because it gives stuff away. Um, but in terms of this here, basically, I'm creating shots within a scene. This is a scene of Aiko, our main character. Um, it's on page one, takes a little over half a page, I think five eighths of a page, basically. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. sure they can read the text on oh, the yeah, screen. So yeah, why, why, don't you just, yeah. why don't you just take yeah. them through? Oh, all zoom, right. Zoom's yeah. even better. So there we go. So it's a. Uh, or just read out. What, so basically, what I'm doing here is that I've taken shots, I've taken small images from um, our storyboarder as the basis here. And then I'm just giving every shot a nickname, talking about the setup of, of the order, we'll film it. Sometimes if um, I might have a shot that is normally set up one, um, but we're cutting carrots before then that we need to put a pot. So maybe it'll be two or three. Right. Um, talking about the type of shot, is it a full shot? Is it is it a medium close up? Is it a medium? Is it a um, cowboy shot kind of hip up shot, um, extreme close up in terms of in terms of where we're going for? Um, um, in terms of this, let me move this over here. A, a, more of a detailed kind of description of every shot. Aiko rocks dad's chair, Aiko turns on TV. Uh, a, basically an Aiko dirty POV of TV commercials, Aiko's clean POV. Um, again, very basic stuff here, but enough information that anytime you're basically going in this, you're, you're trying to choose basically the details you, I want within a shot list. So what I care about is, and again, we are mostly an A camera. We don't have A, B, and C camera. That's not this type of indie here. So I don't necessarily have to call it camera A, camera B here. Um, but there's an example of when we're doing actually shots of commercials on a TV, we're going to shoot it practically, but I've flagged it for VFX as well. Because again, we may be, we're going to be using both screen assets that, that we'll have digitally, but we'll at least try to get the lighting right in terms of live commercials running through a 1970s TV, which is a contraption that our production designer Layla and Jeff are working on um, mm -hmm. right now in terms of being able to do as much practical as possible with still a little bit of VFX to kind of back us up within here. Um, the right. program allows you to, one second. The program allows you just like anything else to be able to choose like, what are the things you want listed in your shot list? So um, you can have a lot more stuff, again, from being kind of a small Indian focus here. It's like, we have our storyboard. We have whether we've already finished the shot or not. What's the nickname? Um, what's the what's the camera setup? Um, if there's colors, I haven't really done too much in terms of all these are. I mean, I have VFX right, shots, right. a certain color, size, lens. If we're gear, if we're doing a dolly, if we're on sticks, if we're doing um, other things in terms of it. So again, it is a pretty. I would say this where where Jeff is a deep dive into technology. I am not right. So mm -hmm. I am. Um, I try to use technology whenever, yeah, we can cut back. I try to use technology whenever possible to just help from a storyboard, from a storytelling standpoint, that isn't too much of a technology deep dive, right? This is right. this is pretty standard stuff. This will, um, as Dana, our AD is working on a schedule and once I'm done this and, and our DP and I go through it, then we'll basically be having the strips and we'll have our daily schedules built off of these here, right? right. And we will have prioritized list of the shots we have to get no matter what. And then less prioritized of shots we'd also like to get here. So, I mean, I might have 15 setups on a day I want to do, 12 of which are have to get no matter what, three or four are would like to get for more editing options here um, in terms of where we're going for. But it's, uh, um, and again, I would say between storyboarder and shot list, and, and this is obvious, I know, but for a director, and I didn't have as much time to do this uh, um, on the first film, uh, Jeff did much more of it on our film Boca. 
I just know this this film inside and out now because I'm having to look at it from every angle, right? Every well, single and, and second. I, again, I think that people who are doing low budget, uh, you know, or lower budget um, event, uh, stuff, they miss this. That they they don't understand it. They're kind of more artists, and they don't do the previs. And they, you know, we all t talk about production. You don't ever finish anything. You just run out of time. And right. time is the, you know, time is the value is the most valuable thing um, that you can, that you can have sitting in front of you is to have more time. And this gives you more time. You have lots of time before there's a crew, <laughs> you know, and, th and then you have very little time and, and it just evaporates. And it's such an important, um, you know, piece of the puzzle. When you're on set, yeah. you're burning money. Like it's the only way to talk about it is when you're in production, you were just lighting money on fire then. And so time has a different value then. And so uh, if nothing else, Jeff's talked I, about this a lot as we're looking at this, which is just um, if for some reason we don't understand the shot on day 13, just whatever I wrote here, whatever it is, it's not doing it. We've got six different still images and a video of our storyboard that we can always go back to very quickly and right. have all of us on the crew understand what we're trying to fight for emotionally at the very least, which is usually most important and then practically as well, right? So it's like, yeah. If nothing else, what's key for us is I don't think we're ever going to get lost in a conversation. Um, yeah, yeah. We always have a guiding principle to go back to in terms of whether animation, whether still shot, whether shot list. And so, again, always trying to create dartboards. Um, it is just the best way yeah. for me to be able to communicate with a crew or a crew, more importantly, to communicate with me. Well, and and to your point and what you said, Alex, about um, about this, you know, the uh, the preparation obviously is key, but um, there's all these amazingly accessible tools that have have a have a tech, tech technical deep end of the pool but also just a really easy free shallow end um i mean yeah. what i've shown is basically the free shallow end of here's my iphone i'm going to wave it around and now we've got a 3d model yeah. and everyone can open it everyone can understand it nobody has to download special software or purchase anything it's all free it's all easy everyone and and you have to remove those roadblocks so that everyone can move forward quickly Right, because yeah. what you know, Alex, and what Jeff knows, at a lot of times, isn't a way a crew processes anything. I think a lot of what you do in office hours, a lot of what this group does is like, try to dismantle the technology, try to try to break it down to basic building blocks. And so right. Jeff can know a lot about a 3D program that could alienate the crew unless he figures out the way that's like, it works in preview, you can just open this up. Maybe you'll turn it, maybe you won't, but I can talk you through this. And so Absolutely. anything that becomes a headache for a crew member gets abandoned right away. It, yeah. And, and yeah. you can almost never bring a crew member back to it. And that was that was part of it. Even distributing the models was was the little sub sentence of you can open these in preview on your Mac. You don't need to like people will hear a 3D model and they'll get scared of like, I, can't, I don't even you know, it's like, no, just it pop it open yeah. like a photograph. And but then you get to interact with it and you can move it. Um, so you, you have to be clear that the, there's a very low barrier to entry. Yeah. Um, for any, cause it's, it, it is a, it is a technical process. Um, but, but it, but it can be accessible, which is exciting. And I think it's really helped us. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've got a bunch of questions, uh, rolling yeah. in. So I'm going to start throwing them at you. Let's go ahead for the first question, Bill. Thanks. Douglas Carmichael has got the first one here and he says, what equipment do you need to use the 3d scanner program? Um, I was, uh, as I said, I was using my, my iPhone 12 pro, um, basically any, any iPhone that has a LIDAR. Uh, and I think they introduced IDAR in the iPhone 11s. Is that is that correct? Um, uh, I think it's 12. It it was 12. 12. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So a 12 or 13. Um, I don't know if you need a Pro. I doubt the Mini will do it or the SE. I think it's the Pro. Yeah. Check your check your iPhone specs. But um, you know, I have a I have a relatively new iPhone, and that's and it was a free app uh, on the App Store. And that technology so, always gets pushed down the next year to the next model to the next model. So. Yeah. Whether 13 or 14, it'll just kind of be the given in all their models. Right, yeah. right. That's now in the system. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Kyle Hammond in Chicago, Illinois says, do you use the scans to choreograph location and or gear moves, or would that be the AD's job? Uh, well, it's the AD's job. Um, do we use the scans? Uh I don't I don't know if she's utilizing them for for camera you mean like company moves or I'm not sure I'm understanding the question correctly um just moving just, between just like when you're trying to figure out the the um the location gear moves you know just where you're going to you know oh, within oh. within this within a shot yes yeah, you Sorry. addressed that a little bit with the uh, the hallway is narrow and you're going to have to figure out camera yeah, positions I mean, there's, there's and whether you can yeah dolly there's also somewhere. just 
And I don't think we were looking at it when we first were doing models. Maybe Jeff was, but it's like the second time here, we're like the, the, um, the master bedroom is going to be for makeup and costumes here. And even for us just having a scan, like, all right, do we have enough chairs? Do we have enough room for basically right. for all of that? Um, so again, whether the AD kind of has a lot of the final AD and our producers, Jeff and Raz have the final say on that, but it's just like, again, it's, it's, it's to be able to look at that and feel, um, feel assured that we're able to solve that within that room. So, so yeah. we do use the models for some of our more practical things. Where's video village, where, where are other things happening within the set? Yeah. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, would you, uh, could you import the 3d scanner data to use, uh, into unreal engine to build walkthroughs? Oh, I'm, I'm sure there's a pathway for that. Um, and that, yeah, that's, that might've been what I was talking about before is that that's something that a bunch of us are, are thinking about right now. Um, you know, and, and whether it's a small scanner or the big scanner, like I, I use a, um, I, I borrow, I don't own, I borrow a, a Faro, which is like a $50,000 scanner <laughs> and, and it, but it generates millions and millions of polygons that you couldn't bring in. So we're trying to figure out how to bring that, that, uh, the polygon count down then get it into unreal, then start adding meta humans, then start you know, playing with cameras. It's still a work in progress. I, I don't think that we have it. Um, the, the person to look at, by the way, in LinkedIn and Twitter and everything else, the person on the front edge of this is Matt Workman. Uh, Matt Workman has been pushing this outer edge of filmmaking with Unreal to the, you know, to the far edge. Do you guys have anything else to add to that? Sorry. I, I would just say this, which is one, when you're an indie film, again, you may not get your location to like three weeks before the film is made. And mm -hmm. so... Um, it's always good for us to know the like the technology can be used by someone else to do more complex and big things that are important. And maybe if we were three months out, we would try to pursue a little bit more of that. But it's right. always it's always good to know where you should put your wall of technology so that it's accessible for what you need to do in any given situation is that all these programs allow you to do five more things than we're doing at any given time. Right. We choose the programs because they can do those things. But then we stop ourselves from doing a lot of those things given time or, yeah. as I said before, accessibility to the crew. If there was a reason for us to to have some part of our production in a, a in an Unreal Engine environment, uh, then I'd start I'd start going down that road. But um, you know, we're we're on the uh, on the uh, the lower economic end of things. And, so, and, and one one of the things we're trying to do is is figure out not only how to do it, but how to reduce that, that work, that, that overhead, that technical overhead yeah. where, you know, if we have, a, if, you know, like if we created a scene with five or six meta humans, you know, that are just there, like they're just a woman, a man, a, the, a child, a, you know, like just that are there, you can make them better. And then we had the cam all the camera stuff at scale. That's all like in the scene. And then we just build something that's really easy to get your model in. It means that you just wouldn't, as a filmmaker, you're not like trying to figure out that process. You're just getting it in there and then just moving people into place and figuring it out it's not there yet. So there, there's, but, but we're, but a lot of us are thinking about, about how to, how to do that because we think it'll, again, to your point, it has to be easy for the filmmaker where it's almost like playing a game. And, yeah, and right. fortunately they make it, the whole engine is there to be play games. Jeff and I are very clear with each other. We're not going to use anything that um, is indulgent. Um, if it's yeah. not helpful for us and we don't see how it's helpful for us, it's not going to be helpful for anyone else. And so yeah. we're always trying to actually pull ourselves back, not kind of just launch forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, next question. Uh, David Anderson in Seattle is up next. He says, can you export as a 2D floor plan with measurements for use in a printed report for building or remodeling? That is a very good question. Um, and then can we build it out of styrofoam? No. <laughs> yeah, I uh, had a director ask that. I was showing the three D models, printed. and he's like, they, "They were like, can you? Uh, you could three D print them." But I had I had a director one time ask, "Is like, can we make this back in foam core?" And I was like, "No, we can't." There's a, a <laughs> film, Shiva Baby. It's a small indie film. It just won a Spirit Award last week. The director made three um, D Lego, just made Lego Lego <laughs> rooms, basically, <laughs> and it sounds he hired silly. his son. It's, Again, that's I'll brilliant five bucks. to just be able yeah. to put like a table with two little Lego figures and a camera and talk about moving, especially <laughs> oh, you know all the camera movements and everything. Yeah. It is, oh my gosh. Yeah. It is. It's probably, if there wasn't a storyboarder, it's where I would be right now is just oh making Lego rooms of this. Because yeah. you can pull out the walls. You can just pull it's it all out and, amazing, and right? stick the camera in there. Oh it's my great. gosh. So, uh, yeah, these are all the export options. Um, I don't, these all look pretty 3D ish. You can oh, do a, an export so floor, video. Floor plan image. Oh, floor plan image. I haven't done that one. Um, you know, maybe, uh, oh, look at that. 
Oh man. <laughs> yeah. That. Oh wow. As we a template for every day or something. That would be right. It's it's, it's awesome. the Mission Impossible set basically is what you're doing now. You're just yeah. like night, night vision goggles on your oh, on your gosh. overlay. That is fantastic. Yeah. Yep. Wow. That'll work. And to we scale. Start here live. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, ne- next question. Next one comes to us from Roscoe Jones in Bray, California. And Roscoe says, uh, would you trust a 3D party to do your three previs, or is it too important for the director and the DP to get a previs shots, to get the previs shots accurate and precise? Um, I think, you know, I, I think it depends on your relationship to previs. <laughs> you know, I think, uh, as Andy said, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of creating dartboards. So our, we're not pre so specifically like this will right. be the camera movement. We will start here and we'll end here. It's, it's much more of like just getting all the people who are in different cities and different states uh, to get familiar with the environment so that we can, we can not step into a, a location fresh um, the moment, the moment. Hey, Jeffrey, there. I misread that a little, and I think it's third party. Would you trust a third party to do your previs? So it's really outsourcing this previs stuff, or are you getting benefit if, from the fact have, that you are you dived have, into it? If you have budget, I mean, there's lots yeah. of things on a film you get a third party to do. It's not about trust. I would say it's not about trust or not. I'm sure there's companies who are incredible at this at a film, our size, basically, um, it matters that Jeff and I do this and specifically Jeff make the models and then we talk about them and then other people talk about them. Just that, that level of intimacy matters on this film based on our budget and the time we have for pre-production. If it's a different world, sure, it'd be great for someone else to do it, but there's always the importance of just being at the location when you're doing it. And, and, and I think that the thing I, I started in film in previous, <laughs> so the, um, worked on this little space movie doing it and the, um, uh, what's nice about it for the dp and for the for the director or the editor is that they're not tech, they're not they're not technical in that area and they're able to just there's something about being creative when you can have somebody when it's not you doing it and there's so many things that i find even for me i will stop short of perfection or or even greatness because i'm i look at it and i go oh, that'd be hard to do you know when at you know like like like, like I, I uh, rather than when i have somebody that i'm paying to do that i go oh, can you do that can you do this little thing here and i notice things and yeah. i and i'll do things that that i don't have to worry about what it's going to take to get it done and, and so and so that's and i think that when i was working on you know at lucasfilm doing these that was you know george would just be like oh, better if it went a little more like this and and then i would go do that and then he would get another image of that that was exactly what he wanted because george wouldn't like do a 3d animation he'd be like oh, that's too hard I mean, I think I, again, I haven't used this phrase in a while, but I used to use it all the time, which great can be the enemy of good. And a lot mm-hmm. of times here, what we need is good. Yep. And if we spend so much time on great, it's just us trying to not do the actual hard work that needs right. to be done throughout all of pre-production. Yeah, no, absolutely. Also, and, and the, the, this process as, as any, as almost any process is, is an iterative one. Right. The first iteration is the script. Then we storyboarded, then we uh, are, are pre visiting and modeling, then we're shot listing, all of which is uh, various iterations before we get to shooting and we'll iterate during the shot, yeah. uh, during the shoot. And then we and then we cut. And so it's just constantly refining and refining and refining and refining and refining. Yeah. Right. What, I forget the exact um, way a lot of people describe a football game, which is each team kind of comes with their seven play, first plays more or less. And then it's it's you have ideas, but you're just you're doing a lot of improv with your ideas that you have planned that will be that's always on a film which is like best laid plans and then you're there and the light's not working the way you wanted to coming into a window right so i mean yep. you're just and, and and you know i think that technical directors also have this kind of a superpower because they're able to understand like you know james cameron does what he does because he understands what that means. Like when he asks for something, he knows what it's going to take to do that or what, where he can cut a corner, where he doesn't want to cut a corner. You know, Ridley Scott can storyboard. So he's able to like be on set drawing, like I want this to be here and this to be there. And, and it, and it makes sense. And so being able to do a lot of your own stuff also gives you the ability to communicate it quickly, you know, without having to have somebody else, you know, in the middle. Um, next question. Roscoe Jones, Brea, California, right back again with any zoom lenses on this shoot. Are you shooting all primes? Um, I am a prime baby. I love primes. Uh, we may have one zoom, but I just, uh, I love still photography and I adore primes. So, um, and I also, um, I care more about the camera moving than the lens moving. And so for me, I'm just, I'm a sucker for tracking shots. I'm a, I'm a sucker for moving. I'm a sucker for a little bit of shake. And so, um, the things I want to control the way I want to tell the story, 
it's it's a prime world for here with maybe just the touch of zoom but possibly not even that there's there's one one shot in particular we're talking about potentially a zoom um and we'll I, yeah it'll be exciting to see what where, whether we use it or not i the uh, as a as a video as a live person I'm, I'm a connoisseur of zoom lenses and as a filmmaker i'm always like sacrilege sacrilege you know <laughs> so, so. I, I, again like all of us or <laughs> many of us when we got like our 5d mark twos or whatever mm-hmm. nikon or sony camera it's got it's like many of us own like the 70 to 200. what yep. i don't use is the 70 to 200 unless if i was a white photographer and i'm in a cathedral then it's like 70 yeah. 200 comes out but I just keep me in a 24, a 35, a 50, and 85, and I am a happy camper every single day. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Roscoe Jones, Bray, California. Are there any potential pitfalls to doing elaborate pre-visualizations? Can it lead to spending too much time on set trying to match the previs? Well, I guess we'll have to tell you once we've uh, come, <laughs> come back from set. Uh, I, I think uh, there's a danger of that, but I'm, I'm, that's not a major concern uh, for me because, I, again, our, our attitude has been all of this previs is, is, uh, is just preparation. Like we're not adhering to uh, the, a, a specific map that we're building right now. Right. right. Our storyboards aren't the dimensions of the rooms. We made the storyboards before we ever found this house, right? Yeah, so yeah. there's something kind of good that our storyboards are not exact because right. then they're not precious. Right. And, and right, what we can't afford right now is like, um, um, as a director, if I come into most situations, I have to have it this way. We will not get the film made the way we need to make it. And so I kind of like that our storyboards, again, are a dialogue and a direction. And if anything, they capture tone and pacing probably more than anything else but they're not accurate in dimensions and where the couch will be and where people will be and things. And so it is just, it's, it's barely a blueprint. They're, they're conceptually illuminating, but yeah. uh, technically flexible. <laughs> Next question. That was nice. That's the name of his <laughs> second album. <laughs> <laughs> Mickey Macacor, our friend in the Philippines uh, says, was location sound mixer part of the location scout? And if so, how has this helped in the pre-production process? Well, the long answer is no. <laughs> yeah, we haven't. We actually haven't done a full tech scout. So what we did is yeah. we we've gone twice. We looked at the location to see if it would work to meet the owners, and then we did basically our production designer went there, um, and our art team went there, so we could basically talk through it. Yeah. Our our AD, our DP, our sound will all be there in about uh, like nine days or so, yeah. ten days. So we'll do a full tech walkthrough, kind of three days before production. Would we like to do a little sooner than that? Sure, but we're shooting in Massachusetts and we're in Philadelphia. Yeah, I, I would have loved to have had a, a, the the location sound mixer there. Um, uh, it, it just it wasn't it wasn't viable before uh, before we can get them there. Um, that said, I've been in communication with them very specifically about what's your rig, what's your strategy, how are you approaching this, what mics are you using, what uh, what's the format that you're recording. You know, like a, a pretty specific technical communication, um, not the logistics of the house beyond sending them the models. Um, and, and that's, yeah. That, that's I mean, there's a, there's a probably about 20 to 30% of this film is just echo in the house without other people. And so figuring out sound specifically, what does it sound? What is loneliness, emptiness, and one person sound like versus dialogue? It's not that it's easy, but it's typical. And so you know how to create the sound for that creating a sound in an empty world of where what's lacking is always kind of a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. He says, uh, could you easily use a drone to perform the same scans? Oh, well, I'm not a drone operator, but uh, probably. Uh, there's there uh, Boston Dynamics actually has a setting or a thing that now you can put a scanner on top of it. It's like the little dog. And the dog walks through the walk through the space and just scans the whole thing. Nice. Um, and it, it, they do it for uh, as built for construction sites. So it's, it's kind yeah, of yeah. fun. It's, it's a little yeah, scary. I don't, want, I, don't, great. I don't want to bring a drone in a house that we are paying insurance and things for, but I think there are ways to do that. Sure. Yeah. Next question. Chris Fritchie in Tomball, Texas up next. And he asks, can you guys define what you call a degree of difficulty when concerning a crew member or a soft and or a software package? Do you mean absolutely no training needed? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's that simple. It's uh, you're dealing with uh, people from all walks of life who have varying degrees of technical savvy. Um, and to speak a common language, it has to be dead simple. Yeah. I mean, no one, again, everyone is a pro- professional in doing their own job and they just like, 
you don't want to create excuses or barriers for someone not to be able to open something, but it's like, it's exhausting for most of us just to be, could you look at this in a different program you've never had on your computer before? Could you download this? Can I take you through this for an hour? Not fun, right? Like it's not, that is, um, again, to the group that talk on, on these sessions, um, as I hear you talk about education, about how do we make this better and things, it's like, there's, there's people always willing to have that conversation, but if you start from there and you alienate your crew from the start, you're not, you're not getting the help you need. I mean, the most basic analogy I can make is, you know, we, we took a bunch of photos um, of the of the location. And am I going to send out the entire crew, you know, a CR2, a, can a, a Canon RAW or a Sony RAW photo? No, I'm going to send them JPEGs because I know they can see JPEGs. And yeah. it's a, you know, we're living in a JPEG world. <laughs> next, next question. Douglas Carmichael up next. He says, could the same LiDAR technology be used to scan live venues for production planning and or audio modeling? Oh, absolutely. I, 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 yeah, I'm sure it's done all the time. Alex, you gotta be doing that. <laughs> yeah. I, in fact, um, I will, uh, I think I can post, uh, some stuff. I just did a scan. Uh, it will not be from a phone. Um, but it will be, <laughs> it, it will be heavier than that. And I'm tempted to just post the raw version of it so people can kind of play with that data. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Remind me about that next week and I'll put it up. Um, the only thing about uh, a live venue and that, it, it, if you're looking very specifically and like in our scans, the, um, you know, you can see the outlet on the wall. Um, sometimes you can't even tell whether it's yeah. a two or a three prong, uh, and in, in an old house, right. that's a question. So, uh, there's certain things that, that you might need, uh, some support for, or just a better scanner. Yeah. Uh, next question. Chris Fritchie at Tomball, Texas is up next. He says, what software or software packages are you using for your 3d models do you model your assets or do you buy as much as possible okay so for storyboarder um they come with basic human shapes basic human poses things like one car um one tree one bush uh tables chairs beds everything else and again this is the first time i ever used this program so um everything else i went to cg trader or turbo squid mostly cg trader my rule for myself was if I can get the model for free and about half of them were free, great, bring them into Blender, then export them for the storyboards. I was willing to spend up to two to three dollars. Um, sorry, I didn't keep the economy <laughs> going on this one for, for about half the models. And then for like 10 key models of like a Japanese hot pot, maybe I'd spend eight or ten dollars, but um, big bucks. Never, I, I never went to the fifty dollars, the hundred dollars, downloading a model, the three hundred dollars. I, I kept it. I kept the whole storyboard, I think, within a $200 budget of every model I wanted. But it, it was funny. I got within like three rooms of it where my oven was um, a box for the first time I made it. I'm like, nope, I need a 1970s or 1960s oven right now. And so that just led me down a trail of like everything will be modeled out. I want 1970s TV. I want a 1960s right. couch. And again, to people's kindness, like uh, as they're building businesses, a lot of people put models for cheap or near um, or free basically on CG traders, they're building up their own businesses. Yeah. I think the other thing is we we're consciously keeping these models, these storyboards with a layer of abstraction, right? You know, we don't want a fully detailed right. model. You know, we want, there's going to be some plants. So get a tree in there. There's going to, there's a neighborhood. So let's get some houses. Is it going to be the same house, uh, you know, eight times down the street? Yes, it is because right. we don't want to get lost in the detail of it. We're building a a concept right. that we're going to launch into not a final picture right do i have a roof on the house no don't care right like it's not i mean you're just just anything that is a distraction from getting the job done walk away from yeah next question douglas carmichael up next and this time he asks could you easily use lidar technology to model museum artifacts or rare parts for example and I'll jump in on that one. The, so the Smithsonian does actually a lot of that. And you, if you go up to the, if you search for Smithsonian 3D models, uh, you will see an enormous number of incredible, incredible artifacts that have been digitized. Those are all using photogrammetry. And so the problem with LIDAR, LIDAR is really designed for distance, you know, like it's designed for um, spaces and volumes and large areas. Um, it is not... It doesn't have the fine detail that you can get out of photogrammetry, which is only limited by the resolution of the camera. And so and now what we're starting to see is a, is a mixture between LIDAR and photogrammetry, which is starting to come together. But right now, the best way to do museum artifacts is photogrammetry. And, and, that's, um, and so that's a, a different, slightly different piece there. Uh, next, last question for the morning. 
Last one for the morning. Mickey Macacor in the Philippines got triggered the same way I did with that earlier thing about outlets. How much power will the set need? And will you rely on house power or generators for your shoot? Um, well, we're, we're getting power assessments, but no, we're not going to rely on the house. We're going to have a generator. Um, the, the, the house does, for it being a, a, an old house, does have an updated electrical system. Um, and, and I'm sure we'll be using uh, some of that. Uh, but no, we're, we're going to have a generator. Our lighting system will be LED based. So, I mean, we'll be using a lot less power than, than obviously the bigger, hotter lights, but it still will need the power. Yeah. Um, do you worry about sound? Yeah. Um, the, <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the, the house is great and it's got a driveway and uh, at the end of a not very long driveway is a road. Um, and the generator sits out there. Sorry. And the generator is going to sit out there. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, I mean, sound is always a concern, um, but I, th but I'm not, I'm not panicked about it. Yeah. I mean, right. Jeff and I, our first film Boca was about two people in Iceland, the world disappears and they're by themselves. You have to think about sound when you don't want to think about sound. We'll be like, this looks like your brother, Joe, who shot the film. It's mm -hmm. like, great. The shot is clean. And then our sound person would be like, that's great. But there was a lot more three blocks away. Right. So, I mean, we had to think about sound at such a level here. There's something not to say we're not scrutinizing it on this film, but it's kind of liberating knowing the world actually exists around her and that right. we're not trying to block out 7 billion people or 300,000 <laughs> people in Iceland. Right, yeah. Right. No, absolutely. Hey guys. So when, when's the shoot again? Uh, March 24th is our first day of the shoot. And then we go to know. April 16th. That's an 18 day shoot over a four week period. That's amazing. Yep. And so uh, we're looking forward. We're looking forward to it. Do we have any more update? You, do, will you be able to come back and do any more updates, or are you now in film mode before you get? No, there? we we can we can do some more. I mean, uh, we both leave next week for Massachusetts. Um, so next time you see us, might be uh, up there. I think we might do a second hour when you're up there, maybe before the shoot. And then we're hoping, yeah. you know, it'll depend. I know that we're still working on it. We're hoping to get some glimpses of the of the shoot itself. Yeah, I mean, we'd we'd love to have you along. Um, we'd we'd love to go again once we're once we're actually on location. Uh, yeah. Glamour says the, the the office is here. Uh, it's not not the same as that that old New England house. So, uh, yeah. yeah, let's set up. And it'll yes. always be Aaron. It'll be entertaining watching us during post where we're just miserable looking. Why didn't we get the shot? We thought we got the shot. We didn't. Get the shot. <laughs> it's just, uh, from a zoo standpoint, right. that'll be fun looking at us from a from the sidelines. Yes, yeah. you can call us out on that. Her bracelet was on the left hand. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where they get you. Um, yeah, the uh, thought her uh, hair was really. black in the last shot. So yeah, yeah. yeah. That's all well, and this is a unique. This is uh, we just really want to thank you. This is such a unique thing for us to get to do, which is to have this kind of. We get to talk about it when you're planning it. We get to talk about it a little before you do it. We'll see a little bit of it being done, and then we'll see the post, and we'll just keep on having you come back every couple of weeks and tell us. Yeah, I, I would also on. say for for people who are interested, and, and clearly there are a lot of people here. For people who are interested in things like indie film. There are amazing podcasts out there, sites like No Film School that'll talk about how to make a rain machine for next to like again. There's there um our our job always is to kind of where we can be more transparent about the process, just to be like, yeah, I, I I'm talking to a director whose film comes out I think this week or next. Who she made a film for three thousand dollars, right? And she and it's a feature film, and she did it, and it's amazing. And so just always admiring those people who figured out ways to get out of their own head and just make the make it and so anytime we can kind of share a little bit more of the process right. um hopefully help others well and i i think part of our intention of, of of doing this and and uh and the social media stuff that we've we've mm -hmm. got started is uh there are great podcasts there are great uh articles and and people are doing a lot of cool things i'm trying to take the approach with us yeah. that we're we're kind of hitting more the where the rubber meets the road layer of yeah, things of like it's there's all these great ideas but the reality is the 3D scan is awfully garbly and, uh, you know, you can get a floor layout, but, uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, the, as you guys have known, I've talked about this for years of wanting to do this thing where you get to see a film get made because a lot of times when we build the training, it's kind of best case scenario or, or right. something that is too janky, like, like, Oh, I can make yep. this for $10. But when you look at it, you're like, yeah, but that will take three crew days to deal with the problems that it's going to create, you know? And so, so, you, you know, that, that realistic, like we're going to show you from the trenches, this is what it actually looks like, I think is, is really important for people to see. And, and almost no, nobody ever sees it, you know, even in the behind the scenes right. that you see on a film, that's all the best of and everything that worked. And then project green light was too much of what didn't work. It's to make it dramatic. Right, right. And some of it's no, just I like, mean, 
you, you, an EPK is a, a sizzle reel, you know, yeah. I mean, that's, that's not, I mean, it, it, you know, you can, everyone loved each other in the sizzle reel. Like every, <laughs> nothing went wrong on a film. And then, and then again, and then project green light was like, everybody hates each other. And there's, right. and the, right. and this truth is somewhere, you know, yeah. in between. Yeah. 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 Well, we're looking forward to it. Come along for the ride. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thanks. Thank you so much again. And uh, we look forward to the next update. We'll work with you on another Friday. We'll have you have you back. And uh, when you're ready for that, and, and I guess maybe next week, possibly if you're if you're ready for that. is it because the night the following next week, week we'll we're be... probably traveling. Um, oh, right, or, yeah. or, or, we'll, or we'll have just so arrived, maybe the 24th so. and you'll be there. But that'll be the 20. Oh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see when we'll we figure it out. Again. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks. Um, and thanks to our producers who uh, who did a great job of asking questions. Thanks to our panelists. We can't do this without you. It was really a fun conversation today. Like we haven't we haven't had a panel that small for a long time. It was very really relaxing. So so it was it was good. Um, so uh, so thanks. Thanks for the, the panelists for such a great conversation. And um, now we will uh, jump into after hours. Remember, tomorrow we'll have uh, AI media on and should be talking a lot about captions. All right. All right. Thanks. Take care.